This is Dr. Mordecai Oganda. He's a, a Kenyan carnivore ecologist. He said that, I didn't say that. He's a trained special trainer, an award-winning Kenyan journalist. He has been investigating and um, uh, writing on wildlife conservation since 2000, right? His book, The Big Conservation Lie, is a wake-up call to question and investigate the narratives around the conversation of Africa's wildlife, and I would say, and beyond. Thank you so much to be here with us. Wonderful and to I'm be here. Uh, very happy for your 20-minute uh, presentation. So see you then. Thank you. Thank you all for coming, and it's great to be here in this, uh, in this wonderful festival, very different from others I've been to before. So who controls the narrative around nature preservation? It sort of ties into what, what we just heard in the previous panel, which, which I'm very happy about the discussions they had there. And what does this get them? Why do they want to control it? I'll start with this slide. Um, this is a BBC report from one day ago. There was something called the Africa Climate Summit that ended in Nairobi in Kenya two days ago. And then this was the result, uh, this is a BBC article. They say Africa pro proposes global carbon taxes to fight climate change. And this is, this is what I'm talking about, these narratives. Um, Africa is a continent of 54 countries, 1.3 billion people. There were about eight presidents here. So it's not Africa. This is about 8% of Africa, or maybe something like that. And um, who's going to do the taxes? Who's, go who's going to be pay paying them? Who's going to be paid? So this is a lot of hot air, if you excuse the term. So what is the narrative of, of conservation around the world? It's one of perpetual crisis. I'm sure you've all heard it. There's, in 10 years time, this will be extinct. In two years time, this will be extinct. There's only 200 of this left, 200 of that left. So the narrative is perpetual crisis. And what is the mechanism of the crisis? It's loss of biodiversity. I'm trained as a biologist. Biodiversity does get lost. Dinosaurs got lost, there were no poachers then. There's so many plants, etc., that have di disappeared without human interference. But having said that, human beings right now are doing a lot of damage, that's true. But the narrative is one of crisis. It's not one of, it's not one of how do we live with, this, with the, these circumstances? How do we do things better? It's crisis, and crisis always demands someone to blame, who is the scapegoat. So according to this narrative, who are to blame? Generally black and brown people. Because if you say elephants are disappearing, who's killing them? It's Africans, right? Um, if uh, leopards, etc., cetera, are disappearing, who's killing them? It's those people who live close to them. We, the world doesn't recognize that the people who live with wildlife or around wildlife that is, that is probably the highest level of civilization. To be able to live here and there's some elephants hanging out there and you're not killing them and they're not killing you and you're living together, that's, that's the highest standard of civilization we should aspire to. And in this context, actually, I think the country the whole world can learn from is India. They've got about 1.4 billion people. They've got elephants, tigers, leopards, and incredible biodiversity in that human population density. So how does this narrative go around? How does the electronic or digital world fuel this narrative? One is globalism. I'll talk more about it. We start losing sight of local realities as we embrace global myths. You're throwing rubbish out here, but someone's telling you that Antarctica ice is melting, but you're throwing rubbish on the road here in Linz. Um, the quantity or volume of media in, and information results in harmful quantitative thinking, offering easy escapes from qualitative behavior change. So when you keep thinking that, oh, the, the Amazon is losing X, X number of trees per year, you forget about what you should be changing about your own behavior in this place. And perceptions, like what I just said earlier, black and brown people, they're driven by disinformation, which always leans towards the informers the informer's biases or needs. So it's the savior complex. So in, in Africa and many parts of the world, we have what we call protected areas. This is uh, national parks, etc. These are very primitive conservation tool. So who's it protected from? 
By definition, a protected area in Kenya is protected from Kenyans. Or a protected area in Tanzania is protected from Tanzanians, protected from the owners of that, of that area. And these are, these are often commons. So media uses terms like habitat encroachment. When you see, this is typical in Kenya, central Kenya where I live, you see this Maasai people with their livestock and there's some wildlife animals around. We see the media talk about this as habitat encroachment, a bad thing. But then in media, we also see white people on horses riding amongst those animals, and we call it a riding safari. Wonderful, romantic thing. So this is what, this is what the, the output, the amount of information we are getting is doing to us. It's stopping us from thinking clearly about these things. And when you don't think clearly, then violence becomes okay. Um, it is something unique to Africa that wildlife conservation constantly involves people with guns and uniforms, and now they use night vision goggles and drones and, and surveillance cameras. It's, we use, right now we are militarizing conservation. We're using military tactical gear for conservation. And apart from that, there's, this, this is driven by other financial instruments. And these include the, some of these things. Schemes like carbon credits, carbon trades, carbon offsets, so-called nature-based solutions. It's a constantly shifting goalpost. It's constantly shifting. You catch up with one thing, they come up with another. And some of the previous panelists here spoke about it. But what comes about the, the net effect is actually imbalance in power and oppression, something similar to colonialism. And this is sort of how it looks. So this is just a map, this is from uh, Sightline Institute. This is a map showing the top 20 carbon polluters in the world. You see there's Europe, um, Asia, China, et cetera there. And um, then you see consumption of earth resources. We need five earths if we consumed at the rate of the United States. We don't need one earth if we consumed at the rate of Niger at the bottom there, which is a typical African country. And look at India. We need 0 0.7 arts. That's the best. They're the best country as far as consumption of, 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 of resources per capita is concerned. But then you look at the carbon credits. Where's the concentration of the carbon sequestration? It's in the global south. Um, the only really honest carbon credits is like in Asia because they're sequestering in the same place where they're polluting. That's in China and in India and all these. But otherwise, the pollution in Europe and the United States is sequestered in Africa. And this, this, this power imbalance is very harmful because this is what drives loss of resource rights, this drives violence, extrajudicial killings, and displacement of people from their homes. So we must be very careful about how, how the digital world drives things. If you look at... Um, cryptocurrencies are getting into it as well. We now have in Virunga Park in Congo actual dams on rivers that are driving, producing electricity to mine Bitcoin in Virunga in Congo. So you have Bitcoin mining operations going on national parks. So the national park and the river is not serving the people who live there. The narrative is that people far away are the ones who are using this resource and who are benefiting from this resource. And the, what we see in media makes this okay, but this is not okay. And these are problems. So recently I was quite happy, the EU parliament in May this year voted to abandon carbon neutral claims based on carbon offsets or carbon trading. And this is good because that, that was greenwashing. One thing you know, carbon trading does not affect production of emissions. Climate change is due to emissions. Carbon trade does not affect emissions in any way. It is just some money changing hands. And so how can the, the electronic and digital world help us? Communication. We can quickly and cheaply share perspectives on environment across the globe. If someone tells you, 
what's happening in Kenya, you can quickly find out on the internet or from someone out, you know out there and that kind of thing. Learning, in real time, we can adapt solutions from elsewhere and avoid repeating the mistakes they made. That is very important. And it can also ha understand how our deeds in a global world can, can impact other people. Like WWF is running programs in Congo which are violently displacing people from the forests, burning their homes, beating them up, killing some of them. You need to know that if you give money to WWF, you're paying for those bullets and guns. You're not paying for a nice fluffy panda bear toy. That's what you get, but the truth is it's buying guns and bullets which are killing people. And it gives us responsibility. Then we need to look, we need to realize that a lot of information is really nonsense, really. I saw this report on CNN, say humans pump so much groundwater that the Earth's axis has shifted by four centimeters. The, the figure was four centimeters. I mean, a shift of four centimeters, if you shift your beer four centimeters on the table, you might not realize it. The Earth's axis, I mean, what does that mean? But this is the problem, the information flow has created a situation where we are bombarded with all sorts of useless stuff that we, we, forget, we forget to interrogate things. And, and this, this again is saying we must reduce groundwater, groundwater consumption. Groundwater consumption, as we drink it, it actually goes back to the ground. Water doesn't go to space or someplace. It goes back to the, to the ground. So we need to interrogate these things. So to protect the environment, I think we need to protect people, systems, and livelihoods, not geographical areas. Protecting geographical areas was, was sort of uh, cutting edge technology a few thousand years ago when they were building Great Wall of China or Hadrian's Wall and this kind of thing. This has no place in the world today. Again, and I'm a scientist. I tell you, do not blindly trust the science. Scientists lie like everybody else. We need money like everybody else. We are on sale like everybody else. So read, understand, and apply it where needed. And, and I just want to be a caution from a, um, a scientific journal. This was published in Nature. And it said the world has 422 trees for every person. And then they gave this graphic. But if you look, if you look at the, the nations named there, number one, number two, number three, and number four, Canada, Greenland, Australia, United States, those are what we call settler colonies. Those are colonies that are not run by the indigenous people. If you follow France, it, then France, then there's Ethiopia as the top African country. Ethiopia has a lot of desert and has a high human population. And then you see China, UK, and India. But why don't they put Gabon here or Democratic Republic of Congo? That would be number one. But that would show that, that would mean that black people are good at conserving forests. And science doesn't want to say that. These are the issues we have to deal with, philosophical issues. So even, even when you're reading academic journals, don't blindly trust what they're saying. Environmental globalism is a poison philosophy. The truths are locally defined. Your environmental truth is where you are locally, what you're doing. The shoe I'm wearing in Africa cannot make you comfortable here in Austria. Or the shoe you're wearing in Austria can't make me comfortable. You must, we must do it locally, then we get global effects. These are a few conservation, what we call conservation, we need to avoid what we call conservation heroes. These are a problem. These people are a problem because they, they make us think that they're saviors in the world. It's Jane Goodall, Richard Leakey, Daphne Sheldrick, George Adamson, Joy Adamson, Diane Fossey, Bernard and Michael Jimek, Mervyn Cowie, all African conservation heroes, but none of them are black. That must mean that there's some prejudice problem. And we see what, we, what even David Attenborough shows on on uh, BBC Earth, et cetera. It, does, it shows wildlife in Africa, but it doesn't show black people. All the, all, the, all the amazing inspiration you get to go and visit Kenya, to go and visit Masai Mara, doesn't show you people. So when you get to Masai Mara and you see people, you're kind of shocked. What are they doing here? They look like criminals. They should not be there. 
And this is the problem of, of what the media is doing right now. I just want to share a few pictures of the reality of Africans living with wildlife. That's, in, that's me in Laikipia, North, Northern Laikipia, where I was doing my studies. That's in Burkina Faso. That's in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. That's in Talek in Southern Kenya. And you don't see stuff like this on National Geographic because black people are not meant to be friends of wildlife. We are the bad guys. And this is from a village called Kazinga in Uganda. It's, it's a video, let's see if it's gonna play. So you can see buffaloes, elephants, and some kids playing and some women washing their stuff and guys going to their boats, etc. cetera. This, this is the reality that exists and it's, it's what we need to wish for or look for. Or, or aim towards, because this is the sharing of habitat. We don't have enough space to separate people and wildlife anymore. That was, that was old and violent and outdated practice. So right now where we are, the West controls the narrative around nature preservation. And that's what we need to change because it is being used to get power, land and resources. Sort of a new era of sort of colonialism. So we need to change that, get an environmental narrative from in about India from India, about Africa from Africa, about Europe from Europe, about, about uh, South America from South America. So if the narrative comes from one place, you'll always get one side of the picture and the world is much bigger and more diverse than that. We keep saying we are fighting for biodiversity. The people who say that they want to protect biodiversity, they don't want to protect human diversity. They don't want to protect livelihood diversity, opinion diversity. So biodiversity alone cannot do it. We have to have diversity of people, of livelihoods, of opinions and everything. And that's, where, that's how we'll get where we want to go. Um, I'm not sure if my contacts are visible there, but thank you for your attention and look forward to the questions. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, we, we have three minutes for a, a, a short Q&A. So, yes, we have a question here. Can we have the microphone here? I know it was not uh, necessarily planned that way, but we are spontaneous and we want to make the most of the time. I'm obsessed with time. I'm the chief time officer here. Yeah. It's sometimes a little bit... But, okay, so here we have a question. Thank you. Please. Uh, thank you for your speech. Um, what would you say, how would we, the, the common people, know when something is true and when something is not, when we read it in the media? And you say that scientists lie. How do we know who lies and who doesn't? Yeah, a, a, good, a good question. I mean, it's, it's about comparing a lot of different sources, sources of things. Um, science right now has become very expensive, especially conservation science. So someone's funding it and the narrative needs to serve the next grant, to get the next grant to get funding and all that. And the, the fact is, look at from the human dimension, the human dimension angle. Um, so if someone's talking about biodiversity in a place where people are farmers, it's about looking at what are the farmers doing? Um, how can they do their farming better? The fishermen, how can they do their fishing better? So I think we need to look more at the human side then that will help the, the wildlife side. If we look at lions, you see conservation is saying, I want to preserve lions, I want to conserve lions. And he says nothing about gazelles. You wonder, are the lions going to eat in restaurants or where are they gonna go? When someone's talking about elephants, needs to talk about habitat, not just ivory, where they needs to conserve forests as well. So it's about understanding the whole system and mm -hmm. how they can live together. So it's, it's complicated, but I think we just need to invest a bit more time in, you see something on TV, try and read something about it. You read something, read something else. Yeah. So it, it, we need to take a bit more time. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I want maybe to mention tomorrow we have two very great sessions. They are more about like AI and synthetic content and et cetera. But one session at uh, 3.10 will be what can I believe? So I think yeah. with a what in a bracket and it will be from understanding how misinformation is working. So I really recommend you the session. I'll be there. We'll, yeah, <laughs> come, come. Absolutely. We have the co-author of the misinformation age, how false beliefs 
spread. So I think this is something which is a great addition to this, uh, to this talk. We will have uh, the founder of Check My Ads Institute. We will have a political analyst, uh, Neri Mawako. So we, I think it's going to be really, really great. And following that, we will have a workshop, how to debunk fakes with tools and tricks. Again, it will be more about misinformation and uh, uh, more, bit, but, but, but we have specially trained fact checker. So I think it's a great session also, and it will be at 4.10. So I recommend you these two sessions. It's more about technology, but well, you know, it, um, yeah. it cannot harm, as we say in French. You, it is, ça peut pas faire de mal. Right, anyway, we have a last question here. I, I, we, we are actually over the time, but I would like to take your question, please. So the microphone is coming, thank you. Do you have examples of engagement with foreign um, organizations and local, local activists in the conservation uh, world that have worked, that you've seen that have been very successful? Um, the, the, sh the short answer is no. Uh, because the foreign organizations tend to be the big ones, the Nature Conservancy, WWF, Conservation International, and they are more in the business of co-opting local, sort of buying consent, that kind of thing. So they use the financial muscle, so they compromise, change laws, change local people's opinions, um, buy, buy their way in. So, so far, so far we, haven't, we haven't managed, and it's about putting finances at the back of the... the, the the conversation and having livelihoods. That's why I said protecting systems, livelihoods. These people, are, these organizations are mostly about protecting a species or a space, not livelihoods. Mm. And the livelihood they consider is only tourism and mm -hmm. those are dependencies really, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you, thank you. I'm going to close the session because we're over the time now, but uh, I want to ask you, uh, so thank you very thank much you for much. coming. There.